good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so uh, we, we're just setting up the projector for a second. So next we're gonna start our uh, question and answer session. So it's gonna be half an hour. Uh, uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Epstein with us today, so please uh, seize, uh, seize this opportunity uh, and ask your question. But I would, uh, I would like uh, to ask you please to raise your hand and introduce yourself before your, you ask your question. Thank you. Okay, so please, if you have any questions, anyone? Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. We really thoroughly enjoyed it. I am Dr. Rajan, consultant from one of the ministry hospitals. It's called Farwaniya Hospital. We are a general hospital, and uh, we cater to a lot of uh, GU cases. Um, I encountered a case a year back in which uh, the morphology was completely oncocytic, and they had the round nuclei. We did the stains also, but I saw some tubules which were entrapped in between, uh, you know, the the oncocytic islands. And the another problem with that case was like, we always, as you pointed out, you know, that they should have a myxoid stroma and should be the nest. So the uh, myxoid stroma was missing. It was very, you know, like tubular and lobular, mostly nests and with entrapped kidney tubules. So if you can shed some light, I don't have any molecular on that case. So we called it an oncocytic neoplasm and like you said, you know, in your uh, lecture. Yeah, oncocytic leash tumors typically will not have entrapped normal tubules in it. Exactly. The one situation where you can see sometimes uh, normal renal tubules uh, within an oncocytic lesion is an oncocytosis. Uh, it'll, you'll have normal tubules in there. So that's a, a potential, but you know, it's, it's obviously difficult without seeing the slides. There's, it, it, you know, it, there could be a lot of potential entities. The normal tubule should not be there, no? Yeah, normal tubule should not be in an, onc in an oncocytoma, right? In basically any of the oncocytic tumors, you shouldn't see normal tubules in, in, in trapped in, in a lesion like that. And it had a lot of uh, degenerative atypia, so uh, does it point towards a benign uh, thing? Typically, it would be more of a benign lesion, okay. right? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Epstein, I'm Karen. I work at Kuwait Cancer Control Center, and I have two questions for you. The first one being, uh, recently we dealt with a prostate core biopsy, and maybe four out of the six scores that we received showed a Gleason score three plus three, six. However, one of the cores showed maybe three plus four, seven. That's what half of us thought of. And the other half thought it was a four plus three, seven. So my question to you is, the four that was there, the pattern four that was there, did not show crib reforming. It showed like poorly formed glands, and it wasn't even at the 50% mark. Maybe around the ones that thought it was three plus four, the pattern four was around a 20 to 30%, whereas the ones that thought it was a four plus three, they presumed it was more than 50%. Now in such a case, when we are dealing with the core, and there is a clear cut discrepancy among the agreement among all the pathologists, how do we handle a case like this? Because it has treatment implications. And that was the, co the main point of concern. Because the surgeons were like, if you guys call it a three plus four, we will just do active surveillance. Whereas if you'll call it a four plus three, then we will go ahead and treat the patient. So it becomes sure. a big problem in such a situation. And the repercussions henceforth, if they do decide to treat it and they don't decide to treat it. So how should we handle such a case? Yeah, so in, at least in the United States, it would be handled by somebody who would sending, for example, me a consult or, or, and we would deal with it. Um, uh, I'm willing and very uh, uh, happy to take consults on an occasional basis. We don't charge from overseas. Um, so if you have cases that are critical for pan patient management, um, you know, again, I'd be willing to, definitely willing to look at it. Uh, it's, 
it's a very common situation where people have problems where there's differences in grading. I would probably say, you know, of the cases I see in prostate biopsy where, where patients send me their consults, because often patients or clinicians will ask the consults sent to me, I'll disagree on the grading maybe 20, 30% of the time, um, because there can be, you know, it can be difficulties in grading, no question about it. But if you cannot send a consult to you at, the, at that point in time, yeah. do you, is it okay to overcall? Like, what would your suggestion I would probably be? say, again, if, you, if you're not sure, I would undercall. Undercall. Because you don't want a patient overtreated. Uh, I'd rather the patient be, in a sense, undertreated, and then they can maybe add treatment later if something happens. But uh, once you overtreat somebody, if they have complications from that overtreatment, you can never go back. So, um, you know, that's... Now, eventually there may be even AI, artificial intelligence, that is being developed for grading, which may be an adjunct. Uh, but currently, you know, that's not something that I, is out there that I would recommend. So currently, the, the, the best is, you know, just to, to show it to others who have other expertise. Um, uh, but, and also, uh, like I've said before, sometimes doing levels can help um, to, to kind of clarify, you know, what's poorly formed versus not worth poorly formed. Okay, and my second question is, in your experience, do you think a pan-keratin immunostain would help to find pattern five when it is difficult to distinguish on an H and E? Yeah, so if you're not sure about pattern five, better than, like I said, better than a pan keratin is a CAM 5.2, uh, the low molecular weight keratin. Okay. okay. There's sometimes prostate cancers can be negative for keratin, like in AE13, a pan keratin. Sometimes high grade prostate cancers may be negative, whereas a CAM 5.2. Uh, will always be positive for but do, you, but do you use it for finding pattern fives in the course? Or not, no, no, I don't use it for, I only use it when I'm not sure if it's cancer versus okay. inflammatory or stroma. But if it's a matter of um, uh, obvious cancer, I don't use uh, keratin stains to see is there five or not. Okay. I would, I would say rarely, I might, if I wasn't sure some crushed cells were five, for example. But I would say for the vast majority of time, it's an H&E. Thank you. Sure. Uh, just a, a few paper I read. Uh, some of the people, you know, when they have a grade five, five plus five cancer, solid sheets, they saw, do, do some, see some granules. They are regularly doing uh, synaptophysin and chromogranin to rule out a large cell kind of a neuroendocrine carcinoma, you know, which should be differentiated from a normal five plus five mm. because they should not be graded and treated separately. Do you do it on all high grade cancers? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the c question in terms of um, looking for neuroendocrine differentiation in prostate cancer. So the issue with prostate cancer is that if you were to take usual prostate cancers, three plus four, four plus threes, three plus threes, and stain them with synaptophysin and chromogranin, you will see a large percentage of those tumors will have neuroendocrine staining, and it means nothing. So you have to be very careful doing neuroendocrine staining in prostate cancer and over-interpreting it to mean it's neuroendocrine carcinoma. So it's, it's a very, Difficult sometimes differential diagnosis between a 5 plus 5 and small cell or large cell neuroendocrine cancer. So when I'm not sure of that differential, I do a battery of immunostains. So I do, PS, I do prostate specific markers. So I do PSA. As I mentioned, we also have P501S and NKX3.1 prostate markers. So those prostate markers should be negative in large cell neuroendocrine cancer and, and small cell carcinoma. I do a KI-67. It should be you know, 70, 80, 90% in small cell cancer. In high-grade prostate cancer, typically even 5 plus 5, 50% or less. I do a stain for RB, retinoblastoma. Uh, you lose RB in small cell and large cell neuroendocrine cancer, typically maintained or retained in usual prostate cancer. I also do TTF1, the lung marker. It's positive in 50% of small cell carcinomas and large cell neuroendocrine cancers of the prostate. It's always negative in five plus five equal 10. So, and probably the most important thing is the prostate markers because um, if you think something is small cell carcinoma or large cell and it has fairly good prostate markers, it's not large cell or small cell. Now, there are some rare cases where something looks like five plus five and it has prostate markers.
but it's diffuse synaptophysin, like 100% or 90%. We don't know what that means. Um, so in those cases where it has both prostate markers and diffuse synapto, I will end up saying, we can't call it small cell, we can't call it large cell neuroendocrine because it still retains prostate markers, but this may be a tumor that's basically in trans differentiation, kind of halfway going towards like a small cell carcinoma or high grade neuroendocrine cancer. And basically what I recommend in those patients is they treat the patients for like regular prostate cancer, typically anti-androgen therapy. But if the tumor doesn't respond, maybe then they should consider treating it like a small cell carcinoma or large cell neuroendocrine cancer. But prostate is, the whole issue with prostate cancer <clears throat> and neuroendocrine differentiation is more difficult in prostate than other organ systems because most other organ systems, lung cancers, bladder cancers, don't express neuroendocrine markers in their usual cancers, whereas prostate does. The other thing that makes prostate cancer, I think, more difficult is that in prostate cancer, we see these tumors that are kind of halfway between usual prostate cancer and small cell cancer, kind of on the, in the process of transdifferentiating, where they have half and half features, which I think makes it much more difficult. We don't see that in other organ systems. But you have to be very careful, because I know of cases where people have overdiagnosed small cell cancer, and patients have gotten toxic chemotherapy and had problems. And then I know of places where people have underdiagnosed small cell cancer and they didn't get also the right therapy. So it's a, it's a difficult, it can be a very difficult diagnosis. But I would say if something really looks like usual prostate cancer, don't do the neuroendocrine stains, because then you're gonna get into trouble trying to interpret them. Uh, Dr. Epstein, I'm Dr. Naqib. I'm working in Kuwait Cancer Control Center. I recently had a specimen of uh, radical prostatectomy, and it was involved about 30% of the gland was involved by the carcinoma, and it showed only one focus where the tumor, there was maybe just a small cluster, a small nest of tumor, which was beyond the confines of the prostate gland, okay? It was not involving the prostatic fat. It was just going, just pushing outside the normal outline of the prostate gland. So when I did deeper levels, the tumor was more, and then it showed involvement of the neurovascular bundle. So I called it positive for extra prostatic extension. But if I would be, face a situation in future in which there was no more tumor on deeper levels, and it showed only just a small nest or a small gland outside the normal outline of the prostate, can I still call it extra prostatic extension? Yeah, so that's a good question. It's a, it can be a very difficult in prostate to determine extra prostatic extension. Every day in our own institution, our other pathologists who are very good pathologists uh, sh show me those cases. So part of it is, it depends where you're looking in the prostate when you're trying to decide what's extra prostatic extension. So if you look posteriorly, posterior laterally and laterally, in the prostate, it has a fairly well-defined edge to the prostate where the condensed muscle ends. So to call extra prostatic extension in that situation is when the tumor goes beyond the condensed muscle. It, you don't have to see it in fat. As long as it's beyond the muscle of the prostate, sometimes in loose fibrous tissue, that's out of the prostate, extra prostatic extension. Anteriorly, there is no edge to the prostate. So anteriorly, you have to see tumor in fat to call it out of the prostate. And at the apex, it's very, very difficult to call, to decide if tumors in the prostate or out of the prostate, because at the apex, the boundaries are very ill-defined. The normal prostate, benign prostate glands are actually in skeletal muscle at the apex. So down at the apex, it's almost impossible to tell what's in or out of the prostate. And then up at the bladder neck, you can call it extra prostatic extension when it's in the thick muscle bundles, then you can call extra prostatic extension. Also, when you call extraprostatic extension, you want to separate out focal extraprostatic extension versus non-focal because the latter has a worse prognosis. Hi, doctor. I'm Dr. Lavi from KCC. So actually, uh, same question I have for the extra prosthetic uh, extension on a core biopsy. Sometimes on a core biopsy, like we find like little bit of uh, fat and with one or two clusters of tumor cells and then you know it's in the middle of the core and then we see the skeletal muscle and then we see the, again the prosthetic tissue. 
So if we find the tumor like that, you know, we don't know like how the biopsy is taken. So in that case, do we call it positive or we have to correlate with the MRI findings? Yeah, so on a needle biopsy, so basically there are extremely rare situations where you can have a little bit of fat in the prostate, but it's very rare and very focal. So if you see cancer on a needle biopsy and it's in fat at the same level of the fat, you can say there's extraprostatic extension because the likelihood of that needle biopsy hitting very rare foci of intraprostatic fat, in my opinion, is almost impossible. So anytime you see cancer and fat together on a needle biopsy, you can say there's extraprostatic extension on the biopsy. Thank you. Yeah, so with basal cell hyperplasia, the architectural pattern typically is abnormal. It's usually multiple small crowded glands, so it actually mimics more infiltrating prostate cancer. But with basal, sometimes you can see basal cell hyperplasia in a bigger gland, uh, which can also be confused with AIP. Um, the difference in that case is you don't, typically when you have basal cell hyperplasia with prominent nucleoli, you, you almost have very scant cytoplasm. It's usually you've lost a lot of the cytoplasm and piling up with the basal cell nucle basal cells, whereas AIP, you tend to have cells with more abundant cytoplasm um, uh, in contrast to just proliferation of basal cells. But also, if, you, if you're not sure, you can do the hyaline or basal cell stain because with basal cell hyperplasia, you'll see multi-layering of the staining. Uh, and you'll see that the atypical nuclei with the prominent nucleoli are labeling, for example, with high molecular weight keratin. Whereas if it's AIP, what you see when you do a basal cell stain is you'll see a very flat basal cell layer with the high molecular weight keratin where the flat layer has no atypia. You, you can barely see the nucleus. It's just a flat little crescent. And then with the AIP, the nuclei with the prominent nucleoli will have no basal cell staining. Uh, it'll be totally negative for basal cells. So that, that can be a helpful way to distinguish the two. Hi, Doctor. This is Dr. Maram Loza from Amiri Hospital. I have one question for you. Uh, if there is a, a cryptoform high-grade pin uh, in a prostate uh, biopsy, do you prefer calling it as such or only uh, we call it like atypical proliferation? Yeah, so if something looks like cryptoform high-grade pin on a biopsy and it's either going to be typically introductal cancer, I would call it, or AIP. Depending if it's dense cribriform, that makes it introductal cancer. If it's big open spaces, I would call it AIP. But yeah, in general, yeah, I would never, uh, I used to, but I don't anymore call cribriform high grade pin on, on anything. Yep. Sure. And it's important now because, as I mentioned, now, it, now, for the most part, when you're all just get a biopsy from a biopsy high grade pin, they often now don't do anything about it, they're not worried about it anymore. Whereas introductal cancer, they would definitely be worried. And I think the problem with AIP is I think it's a new concept and urologists are not familiar with it. So if you diagnose something as a typical introductal proliferation AIP, you have to put in a comment or talk to the urologist and explain to them what it means, saying that this could be introductal cancer, it doesn't fully meet the criteria, um, and it's something that probably should get a repeat biopsy because they, it's just not something that urologists are going to be, uh, know what it is. Yeah, it's a good question and sometimes a difficult question. So the tumors that show aberrant P63 staining most of them actually behave uh, 
in a fairly indolent pattern, uh, prognosis, more uh, comparable to a three plus three equals six. But morphologically, many of them look more like pattern fours, often poorly formed glands. So there's a disconnect between what they look like and the grade. So in many of these cases with aberrant P63, I don't give them a grade. And what I end up saying is that the grade, most of these tumors behave better, less aggressively, and their grade may inaccur inaccurately reflect how they will behave. So I don't assign a grade. I have seen some, rarely, P63 aberrant cancers that are overtly high grade, uh, uh, extensively solid areas, um, and those I will, I don't give them a Gleason grade, but I just call them high grade and say the you know, Gleason system may not apply to the P63 aberrant cancers. But a lot of them I don't give them a grade. Just a small, uh, on, on the, uh, you told that we give percentage for, uh, uh, for the uh, pattern four. So, you know, sometimes you see in a core biopsy, you know, the edges are at, uh, the glands are at the almost, you know, sort of edges. So, do you give it, uh, take it 10 plus 10% 10 of the total or the in-between normal glands should have to be included in that core? Uh, I hope you are getting the... Sure. Yeah, so... So when we measure the cancer, um, sometimes you will see discontinuous cancer, for example, on a yeah. biopsy. You may have a little bit of cancer on one edge, maybe take the extreme, a little bit of cancer on the other tip of the core with all intervening benign tissue. What has been shown is that in 85%, 90% of these cases, when you see a little bit of cancer on one end, a lot of benign tissue and then a little bit of cancer. It's the same tumor going in and out of the plane of section as opposed to two separate or multifocal tumors. So when I give how the extent of the cancer on the biopsy, I say where the cancer starts and where the cancer stops, and including the benign tissue in between. Now, in cases where there's a lot of intervening benign tissue, I, what the terminology I use to match the histology is, for example, I will say small foci of Gleason score 3 plus 3 equals 6 prostate cancer discontinuously involving, for example, 80% of the length of the core. Um, but that is a, in the United States, it's not uniformly done. So that is a problem. Some, for example, I might get a consult where somebody had said there's 10% of the core involved um, because they took two cores, the cancer with a little bit on one area and another, and they just mentally put it together, 10%, and I'll sign out that same case as discontinuously involving 80% of the core, and a patient gets the report and says, how can one pathologist call it 10%, one pathologist call it 80%, but that's, that's the reason. Thank you, thank you. Right, so if you see something atypical that you're, you might do the stains, you might not do the stains, that you're suspicious as cancer, but you're not 100% diagnostic or definitive for cancer, you definitely should report it because studies have shown that in you know, about 40% of those patients there will be cancer and repeat biopsy. Some urologists, as I mentioned, may do the repeat biopsy. Some may decide just to follow the patient with imaging or serum tests. But you definitely want to flag those patients as having something atypical so that they're not potentially lost to, to follow up and, and, and not followed carefully. Um, I don't use the term atypical small acinal proliferation. I use the more descriptive small focus of atypical glands and then the note that I use. 
but uh, either one is appropriate. Um, I think the most important thing is to convey to their all just that there is something there that's not definitive for cancer, but you can't be 100% sure that it's not cancer, and, and therefore you want that patient to be followed carefully. And there are some cases where, you know, you may have two or three cores, uh, three or four parts that are atypical, and so it's not uncommon. Um, and again, some cases, if I look and I see just one or two glands that are atypical, I won't do the special stains because I know no matter what, I'm not gonna be able to make a definitive diagnosis, I'll just call it atypical. Uh, there are some cases I'll say mildly atypical, so cases that you know, I favor it's benign, um, and then there are other cases at the other end of the spectrum I'll say highly atypical for cancer, but I still can't make a definitive diagnosis. Dr. Epstein, um, in, in a prosthetic biopsy, only in one site, if one core is showing just two or three glands, but which are showing all the features in a mental balance sheet, if we say that, yes, these glands are showing all the features of carcinoma, but the glands which are showing the carcinoma are just one or two in the entire biopsy, then can we call it adenocarcinoma? Yeah, you can call it if you're 100% sure it's cancer. Um, again, typically in that scenario, uh, with just a few glands, this, the most common scenario that I will feel comfortable calling those cancer is when those glands are tightly packed in between benign glands, so I know it can't be high-grade prostatic endoepithelial neoplasia. Because th the one thing that can mimic limited cancer is high-grade pin, just being a tangential section, but if those glands are situated in an area where you could not have high-grade pin, tightly in between benign glands, then even with just a few glands, yes, you can call it cancer. Thank you, doctor. We recently had a kidney case. I know we've not discussed the staging of kidney tumors, but uh, we had a kidney case in which there was a completely encapsulated clear cell renal cell carcinoma bang in the renal sinus fat. It was completely encapsulated, but it was within the fat, and it measured around three to four centimeters. So how would we stage this? Would this be a T2, depending upon the size? Or because it was in the renal sinus fat, would we call it a T3? So th there was no component in the kidney? No. In all the sections that we took, it was only within the fat. Yeah, that's very unusual. I can't say I've ever seen such a case. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've just never seen a kidney cancer but not being in the kidney. The, actual, the point of contention was because it was completely encapsulated, none of the cells were actually touching the fat. So normally when they say you want to call it a T3, the cells have yes. to either be adjacent to the fat or... Yeah, so one thing that can happen, which might have been the situation that you're talking about, there are some t cases where you can have a renal cell cancer rising just from the outer cortex. So it looks like it's not in the kidney. It's arising from the most outer cortex, and then it protrudes into the fat as a rounded nodule. So 99.9% .9 of the tumor is bulging into the fat as a round nodule. In that scenario, if it's a low-grade lesion and it's a perfectly round uh, a surface to it, I would call it T2. Thank you. Sure. Just one thing I would emphasize for staging of renal cell cancer is it's now recognized that when the renal cell cancers invade uh, out of the kidney, they typically do at the hilum. Uh, that's also where you see renal vein segmental branches of the renal vein involvement. So for any cancer of the kidney that's anywhere near the hilum, you want to put through four or five sections of the hilum looking for vascular invasion and, and extension into the hilar fat. Just an observation. Uh, regarding FH deficiency, HLRCC related uh, renal cancer, I saw the case, it was uh, very nice with the prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. Was the case, had uh, had patient uh, any uh, leomyomatosis in the uh, uterine leomyomatosis or uh, uh, in the skin? You showed one case of HLRCC related yeah, I'm not sure in the case that I had, that I showed, whether that patient had the stigmata of HLRCC or whether it was sporadic, I'm not sure. Because we had a couple of cases of uh, FH deficiency, which could not be confirmed by uh, 
only morphologically we, we suspected FH deficiency, but uh, molecular testing was not done, or uh, either immunohistochemistry. Yeah, one thing I would stress is for if you're doing a fair amount of renal pathology, um, is to consider getting the FH antibody and the uh, SDH antibody. They, again, straightforward immunohistochemistry, there's nothing, you know, uh, unique about those antibodies. They're straightforward, immuno, just like any other antibody. Um, those I would recommend getting along with CA9. Uh, and most people have C-Kit or CD117, I think. And again, consider Cathepsin K because diffuse Cathepsin K suggests uh, translocation-associated RCC. Those are kind of some of the major, maybe newer markers to consider for that getting for kidney tumors. Thank you. case is a patient uh, who had a transurethral section of the prostate for urinary obstructive symptoms, uh, very nonspecific. Uh, most prostate biopsies and TURs, uh, for the most part, I don't find clinical information very helpful. PSAs can be high, they can be low, and, you know, uh, rectal exams can be abnormal, for the MRIs can be abnormal, all, any imaging can be abnormal and normal. Most of these are just not very specific, so ultimately we have to rely on the pathology. So what we see here is a papillary lesion, very striking papillary lesion. As I mentioned, prostate, usual prostate cancer, uh, doesn't have typically a papillary pattern to it. That's not one of the classic patterns of prostate cancer. When we look at the cytology of these, of these papillary fronds, again, it's not the typical cytology of usual prostate cancer, cuboid alignment. These are very pseudostratified, they're columnar epithelium. Uh, that's a classic findings of prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma can have a range of cytologic atypia. Here we can see some having some prominent nucleoli, but if we move it around a little bit, you know, some of these will look more, you know, the nucleoli are not as prominent. Uh, and that can be a problem sometimes. Some pathologists are not comfortable calling prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma where there's you know, less prominent cytologic features. But architecturally, when you see these papillary structures uh, lined by stratified columnar epithelium, there's nothing else that this can be. This is prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma. Now in the past, I would have looked at this case and said, okay, this is prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma, Gleason score four plus four equal eight, because that's what we call uh, papillary prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma, Gleason pattern four. But now, based on cases that I've seen and studies that I've done, I now recognize that prosthetic ductal adenocarcinomas can uncommonly sometimes be confined only within the ducts and not be invasive, just like usual prostate cancer. So when I see a case that's not overtly invasive, such as this case with these exophytic papillary structures, 
I will do uh, special stains for basal cell markers. And when you come here and do the basal cell markers in this case, you can see that basically all of these papillary structures are still look kind of above the, bit, the basal layer and are surrounded by a basal cell layer. So this is a rare case of prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma that's intraductal, it's non-invasive. Um, in a sense, intraductal ductal prostatic adenocarcinoma. So again, confusing terminology, intraductal means location, ductal adenocarcinoma is type of prostate cancer, cytology. What does this mean for the patient? 90% of the time, if they go back and do a repeat TR, there's an invasive high-grade ductal adenocarcinoma component. And this is just a manifestation of the ductal adenocarcinoma growing into the ducts. They're kind of protruding out into the urethra. But in 10% of the time, that's all there is. It's all intraductal. Uh, prosthetic ductal adenocarcinoma in this patient is, is cured. So it's analogous to usual intraductal cancer. Ductal adenocarcinoma also presents, can present very distinctly. So in a case like this, this is going to be a papillary tumor projecting into the urethra. To the urologist, this is going to look like papillary urethelial cancer, not like prostate cancer. The patients present with hematuria, normal rectal exam. So again, everything looks like it's a urethelial cancer. So be prepared that when you tell them this is prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma, they are going to be potentially confused and maybe say that doesn't make sense and you have to explain this type of prostate cancer can manifest and present like urethelial cancer but is in fact prostate cancer. Let me also, as I go through these cases, if because they're all different types of cases, uh, different types of organs, uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand um, and ask about it because um, otherwise, you know, I'll go on to the next one and you'll never get an answer. Yes? Do you recommend the repeat URP in this case? So it's a good question. The question is do I recommend repeat URP? Um, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do because the, if you do a repeat TRP, for example, there's nothing there, which is a potential, and then the patient, you wouldn't want a radical prostatectomy or radiation. Uh, and if you go back and do a repeat TR and there's invasive prostatic duct cancer, high grade, yes, then that patient does need additional therapy. Okay, this is a patient with elevated serum PSA level. Again, nothing that's specific. And this is a, one of the things that I talked about earlier, so we'll go over it uh, again, kind of go over it on a case that we can move the slide around a little bit. So what I see here at low power is I'm seeing some of these glands that look more benign architecturally, the larger glands of infolding, but they look darker. So when I see that, I think of PIN. So I think, okay, it could be PIN. But the other thing I'm starting to pick up on is that if you look along the edge of the core, um, you can start seeing that there's this long kind of cystic space here uh, of similar type of epithelium. So if we go to a little bit higher power and look at these along the edges, we're seeing, again, this long, uh, this columnar epithelium along the edge of the core. And if you kind of go up here, for example, that's I think nicely shows this columnar, darker cytoplasm epithelium along the edge of the core. So when I see that on a needle, as we talked about earlier, the thing to think is to think, could this be pin-like ductal adenocarcinoma or pin-like cancer? Because pin shouldn't be cystic like this. Um, so in a case like this, you know, you could raise the possibility of pin-like ductal cancer on a needle, but you wouldn't be able to make a definitive diagnosis. So what you'd want to do is then do the basal cell stains. And when you do the basal cell stains, you can see all the glands in the middle that look more like pin are entirely negative. And if we look at some of these glands along the edge, also they're negative, these big cystically dilated spaces. Like all along here, this whole big strip of epithelium is negative. So this is pin-like ductal cancer or pin-like cancer. And I would grade it as a three plus three equals six. This is from another case uh, to show uh, in a radical what it looks like. So interestingly, in a radical, this radical had areas like this, which the glands look like pin in that uh, usual ductal cancer is going to be papillary or cribriform. These are not papillary or cribriform. These are individual glands that look like pin. Uh, 
and then we come also over to here, we see these big cystic glands, which at low power you think, oh, that's just BPH, cystic big BPH glands. But when you look at higher magnification of these cystic glands, they're also lined by these columnar epithelium uh, with cytologic atypia. And when you look at the, the basal cell markers, so first we go to the areas that were more crowded pin-like glands, all of those are negative. But then even those big cystic dilated glands are all negative for basal cells with markers as well. So this entire lesion here is pin-like ductal cancer with these big cystic spaces. Uh, and you can, again, imagine if you stick a needle into something like this, this you are not going to get the entire cystic gland on a needle. You're often just going to get those big strips of uh, gland, uh, atypical epithelium along the edges of the core. So the main thing is to at least think of pin-like ductal cancer as opposed to pin when you start seeing cystically dilated those strips of epithelium along the core and do the basal cell markers. Okay, so this is somebody who had a history of prostate cancer. And I'm first going to show you cancer with treatment effect, and then I'm going to show you another slide from another case of benign prostate tissue with radiation effect that I think shows it better in terms of what benign glands look with radiation effect. So cancer that's been radiated, as I mentioned, sometimes the cancer will not respond to the radiation. It looks like usual prostate cancer. In that situation, you have no problems. You grade it just like usual prostate cancer. Diagnostically, you don't have a problem. It looks like usual prostate cancer. But sometimes, cancer that is responded well to radiation doesn't look like usual prostate cancer. And what they often have is, first of all, very atrophic glands. They often have vacuoles in the cytoplasm. The nuclei often look very kind of pycnotic and, 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 and not overtly that malignant. But architecturally, they're abnormal. This is not a normal architectural pattern of, of benign glands. And if we come over to here, these crowded clusters of glands are also not a normal pattern of, of, of benign glands. But if we were to grade this, we would grade this as pattern four, because many of these, some of these glands are three, but some of these uh, look like more poorly formed glands. But for example, in here, there's even some individual cells, some of these other cells with vacuoles, we would consider even pattern five. But this is cancer with radiation effect. These patients, that means that tumors responded well to the radiation. Uh, this patient it, it, they, it is likely cured by the radiation. So to grade this as pattern four, pattern five, obviously would be entirely misleading. So in a case like this, we just say cancer with radiation effect and don't give it a grade. If you do a pin four in cases like this, or, they basically light up uh, with the basal cell markers. Um, so if you go, for example, into the, or I should say not light up, they are negative for basal cell markers, light up, and they're positive for racemase. Uh, this case is not so positive for racemase, but you can see entirely negative for the basal cell markers. So you can always use the basal cell markers uh, if you're questioning, could it be cancer with treatment effect? When you're looking at a radiated prostate, you're basically looking for little clusters of glands with abundant cytoplasm, kind of pycnotic nuclei and vacuoles. Those are the clues that you're looking for radiation, radiated cancer. Now, again, remember that radiated cancer, often the cytology looks pretty bland. It often the nuclei look pycnotic and bland. In contrast, prostate tissue with radiation change, benign prostate tissue, tissue with radiation change, Paradoxically, the cells look much worse than cancer. So the key thing with benign prostate tissue with radiation change is that at low power, the glands are still architecturally, spatially separated from each other in a normal distribution. So if you look here, you can see this kind of gland stroma, gland stroma, gland stroma. They're all spaced apart, not crowded, not irregular. So it's a normal architectural pattern. The glands tend to look very blue at low power because radiated benign glands are very atrophic. But what's very dis disconcerting at, at when you go to higher power with radiated benign glands is you have tremendous cytologic atypia. But the atypia tends to be very degenerative in nature, smudgy chromatin, hyperchromatic, uh, 
You can see nuclear lines, so that's something to be just to be aware of. But many of the nuclei are smudgy. The key feature in radiated benign glands is that often the glands are multi-layered. You just move it around. So for example, here, we can see many of these glands are multi-layered. Also, in the same gland that you see big nuclei, you'll see small nuclei, so there's variable size. Whereas prostate cancer tends to be more uniformly uh, all atypical. The other thing that we can see, let me see. So again, here are the big atypical nuclei in the same glands are small nuclei, some with nucleoli, but some smudgy. That's a characteristic radiation effect. Again, atrophic glands. Let me just see if I can find a situation with kind of more streamy cytoplasm. The other thing that you often see with radiated benign glands. Is, this, is that the nuclei often stream. Here we see a little bit, they almost look like they're streaming kind of parallel to the base of the membrane. Um, that's classic for benign prostate tissue radiation effect as well. If you stain up benign prostate tissue with, with uh, radiation effect, uh, it'll light up with uh, high molecular weight inside of keratin. So it becomes you know, very straightforward if, if just doing the basal cell mark. Next case is a paratesticular nodule. Uh, so uh, it's labeled as paratesticular nodule, but it looks like it's more like in the testis. So what we have is a testis that's pretty much, you, know, you can't really make much out of the testis. Uh, we see this area of necrosis. So anytime you see a necrosis in any organ system of the body, but now let's talk about the testis, you want to carefully look at it and say, what is this necrosis? Is it infectious, tuberculosis? Um, is it an infarct in the testes, which you can see due to vasculitis or the trauma? Or is it a necrotic tumor? And so let's look at it a little bit at higher magnification. And what you can see when you look at it at higher magnification is that this is cellular necrosis. We can make ghosts of cells in there. When we use the term cellular necrosis, basically we're saying it looks like necrotic tumor. And in, in the testis, sometimes when you see cellular necrosis, you can actually make out even what type of tumor this is. So looking at this, this looks like seminoma. The individual cells, you can still see these big central nucleoli. Um, but it's important to recognize and don't just call it necrosis or don't call it uh, torsion or, or something else. And I've seen cases where pathologists have had areas uh, where it was all dead and they just called it benign necrosis and the patient went undiagnosed for many years uh, and developed metastatic disease. Now one thing, we did a study on necrotic germ cell tumors, and even though they're necrotic, sometimes the germ cell markers can still be helpful. This is an OCK34, and even though everything's dead, you can still see that you know, it's still trying to pick up some of the nuclei um, in, in this dead material. Now, obviously, its stains are not as good as if it was viable, but I still think, in, given the morphology and the OCK34, you can end up saying that this is definitely necrotic germ cell tumor. And maybe you're not entirely 100% comfortable saying it's seminoma. I think it looks more like seminoma than a vinyl cancer. But at least you can say necrotic germ cell tumor is suggestive or in favor that it's necrotic seminoma. But the main thing is don't, anytime you have necrosis, carefully look at it. Um, see if it's cellular necrosis, could be necrotic tumor. Uh, the, the whole process or const, uh, uh, the phenomenon of regressed germ cell tumors, where germ cell tumors can totally undergo necrosis and scar down, even with uh, extensive metastases, uh, is, is sometimes you can have only the necrotic tumor, all necrotic, uh, before it scars down into a scar, uh, where you have to recognize it's dead tumor. Okay, so here's a, what, a kidney tumor that we talked about earlier. So uh, as I mentioned, we'll reinforce, uh, I bombarded you with a lot of uh, kidney lesions. So we'll go through one of these and see how we do. So what we see in this case is, first of all, we have this component, which is tubular. So as I mentioned, whenever you see a lesion that has clear cytoplasm, which this does with a lot of tubules, 
you should be thinking clear cell papillary renal cell tumor, not clear cell RCC. Clear cell RCC, typically you don't see a prominent tubular component. And then very nicely, I talked about how you have the subnuclear vacuoles, reverse polarity with clear cell papillary renal tumor, we have that here. You also have to have low grade cytology, they should always look grade one cytology. Um, here we have a little papillary component of the clear cell papillary renal tumor, that's, that's totally acceptable as well. And then, if you're not sure of it, the stains you want to do are CA9, it should be diffuse CA9, and we mentioned we talked about the cup shapes. So to look at the cup shapes, you want to go into some of these little tubular areas. And basically what you're seeing is more staining along the lateral edges and not as much on the the surface component, so for example, if you look at a cell like this here in the middle, you have staining on the sides and on the bottom, but you know, not on the surface. So this good staining, and then the other thing that you want to do is a CK7. As I mentioned, clear cell RCC is, can be CK7 positive, so low grade ones, but never diffuse CK7. So if you see a clear cell lesion with diffuse CK7 like this, that's not clear cell renal cell carcinoma. You should be thinking of clear cell capillary renal tumor, which is a benign entity. Is this the same as uh, chrom what they used to call chromophil? I have no idea what, uh, I have no idea what they used to call it. Uh, okay, you're still, telling me that I'm ancient. <laughs> no, I'm ancient too. Because when, when I started in my residency, when I started in, as a faculty in pathology, the way we called renal cell cancers, I think about it now, it's laughable. We used to call them pretty much the same thing. We used to call them basically clear cell, kind of eosinophilic, mixed clear cell and eosinophilic, mixed cell, clear cell and papillary. We would just, you know, kind of put whatever we saw and, and wrote it out, and right, as, as opposed to a specific type. So, but, yeah, and, so, and then they started having cytogenetics with trisomy 7 and 17, and we realized that's papillary, and, you know, lost 3P in clear cell. So, and then finally, like, it came out, and now we have a whole, you know, whole different paradigm. Yeah, so I don't know what we called these things in the past. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting now, I go through, as I said, I have these I have fellows that I train, and we go through some of my older cases, and I'm going through these older cases, and I say, oh, this is in, in ESC. You know, right? but it was a 2009 case before ESC was discovered. So I look at what we called it, and most of the time we started off with peculiar, you know, or unusual tumor that we don't know what it is, because you know, we didn't know what they were at that time. Okay, the next case is somebody with gross hematuria. Um, and so what we have in this is a bladder biopsy. And the first thing you can see is it's very hemorrhagic. And this is an entity that is often overlooked, um, but important not to. So when you see a biopsy that has a lot of hemorrhage in it, and you don't really see anything, you know, it's not tumor, and you don't really, you know, you're not sure, you know, you know just, look carefully at the vessels and make sure that you don't have pink material around the vessels which is amyloid so this is cracking you can see the amyloid tends to crack in little pieces around the vessels which is classic but amyloid uh, occurs in the bladder not that rarely some this one is basically around the vessel sometimes amyloid can be so extensive that it infiltrates the muscularis propria and can actually weaken the muscularis propria these vessels are weakened, and you can actually have a significant hematuria with the, with the amyloid. Uh, but it, it's something that, again, if you're not looking for it, if you don't think about it, you, you don't make the diagnosis, just like in a lot of, a lot of parts of the, a lot of other organs as well. Um, and then the other thing with amyloid is uh, that I look for is, do I see a lot of plasma cells? So if I see a lot of plasma cells, I'll do kappa and lambda, but sometimes these amyloids will be associated with a light chain abnormality. But if I don't see a lot of plasma cells, I typically won't do the immuno, um, and don't bring up the issue that this could be associated with a plasma cell discretion. This is the Congo red, just on the same case. See, it's you know, nicely you know, staining some of this, maybe those vessels. 
Next one is a papillary urethral carcinoma of the bladder. So in terms of grading bladder cancers, when you grade bladder cancers, you grade them both uh, first, uh, there's multiple factors that go into deciding whether something is low grade or high grade. First is architecturally, so low grade, the, the papillary fronds tend to be fairly distinct, not fused. So if I were to look at this biopsy, that would favor low grade. I look at polarity. Polarity means are the nuclei evenly spaced apart, uh, relatively uniformly distributed, as opposed to clumped and irregular, kind of haphazard growth pattern. So I would say these are pretty, polarity is pretty well maintained. I look at the cells cohesive. High grade tumors tend to be like, just like carcinoma in situ, they tend to start falling apart. But whereas low grade tend to be more cohesive, this is cohesive. So everything's going well for low grade. And then the final thing you look for is cytology. You know, are these all pretty, you know, bland nuclei, you know, nuclei or do we see, start seeing some larger atypical nuclei? And then when you go into this case, you say, oh, you know, this must be high grade because I see some of these big atypical nuclei. But when you look at these nuclei, it's not typical of a high-grade capillary urethral cancer. Very smudgy, degenerative chromatin. Like if you were looking for mitotic figures, you wouldn't find any mitotic figures here, hardly any. If you did a KI-67, which I don't routinely do on papillary tumors, but let's say in this case I might. If I did a KI-67, now let's actually look. I didn't I want to say if we did a KI-67. So now you do a K67, you say, okay, this is a tumor with all these big cells. It should, those big cells should be very highly proliferative. But if we look for the big cells, let's find an area of some of those bigger cells. In this case, this, and you're always gonna have some KI, but what you wanna look for are the big atypical cells KI positive. And you start looking here, for example, there's some of these big cells that are KI negative. And if you start looking over here, there's some more of these big cells that look degenerative there, get no KI. So this is a case of a low-grade, non-invasive papillary urethral cancer with degenerative atypia, mimicking a high-grade papillary urethral cancer. And we did a study on this a little while ago and showed they behave like low-grade papillary cancers as well. So, uh, just a, pit, a pitfall to think about when you're grading bladder cancers, that if you see atypia but it looks very degenerative, unaccompanied by mitotic figures, you know, consider could this be degenerative atypia as opposed to truly a high-grade papillary cancer. This is the mass at the dome of the bladder. So when you're in the dome of the bladder, you have to think of potentially your rachial lesion. And so your rachial lesions, you, we all have basically, your, your, uh, your, we used to have a urachus that went basically uh, up uh, from, from the fetus to the umbilicus. Uh, in a, when, when you're an adult, that tract becomes basically scarred down, it turns into the median umbilical ligament, but we can sometimes still have little urachal remnants, sometimes urachal cysts, and sometimes we can get tumors arising within these urachal remnants. Although the normal urachus is lined by urethelium, uh, when we get neoplasms in the urachus, typically what happens is that urethelium undergoes glandular metaplasia. So most neoplasms in the, in the urachus end up being glandular, either villus adenoma, adenocarcinomas of the, of the urachus, less commonly urethelial cancer. But we can also get, here's a urachus, for example, here's the little remnant of our, the normal ure urachus here, lined by some urethelium. So that's normal urachus. Here's some, again, part of our normal urachus. And what we can see here is this normal urachus now is ending up into this mucinous neoplasm. And mucinous neoplasm is lined by this mucinous goblet cell epithelium with some atypical nuclei next to it. But it's not overly invasive. Uh, there's some mucin extravasation here. But if you look at this mucin here, it's acellular mucin. There's no epithelial invasive adenocarcinoma component. There's no epithelium floating in the mucin or lining this irregular mucin. Uh, if you look on another slide, and here's this extra extracellular mucin. Here's this mucinous epithelium aligned by kind of pseudostratified pulmonary epithelium. Some areas it's very bland, aligned by goblet cells. And the way to approach urachal lesions is you have to think of them as intestinal lesions. 
Because basically that's what they are. It's intestinal metaplasia. So if you were to have this, for example, in the appendix, with this very, in some areas, very bland uh, mucinous epithelium, other areas a little bit more adenomatous, filled with this mucinous epithelium. In the appendix, we would call this a lamin, low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. So basically, in the bladder or in the uracus, this is a low-grade uracal mucinous cystic neoplasm. So entirely analogous what you would see in the appendix. And because the, the uracus has all these tubules that are going in and out of planes of section, you have to be careful not to overdiagnose invasive cancer. All of these little outpouchings, there's no stromal reaction. Cytologically, they're not fully blown carcinoma. The nuclei are still oriented at the base. Uh, so this is all still a low-grade mucinous cystic neoplasm with an extracellular mucin, uh, not invasive adenocarcinoma. And if it's all resected, this patient should be cured. And if you find epithelial cells within the extra mucin, does it make it malignant? Yeah, if I saw little like signaling cells floating in here or little strips of epithelium in this mucin, yes, that would be a mucin that's out in the car smell. Right. So this is one of the more common uh, lesions, that's stroma lesions I see on a prostate biopsy. Uh, so what we have here is a very cellular stromal lesion. And again, this is one of the most common kind of mesenchymal lesions I see in consultation. And the common question, it's reasonable, is this a stromal tumor? Is this a stromal tumor of uncertain malignant potential, a stump? Is it a stromal sarcoma? Is it a lot of myosarcoma? sarcoma? All this is is stromal BPH. And that's why I see it commonly, because stromal BPH is common. So how do we tell it's a stromal nodule of BPH as, to, as opposed to a stromal neoplasm? And the key is actually not the stroma. The stroma, you, know, you can't tell. The key thing is the vessels. When you see these small capillaries that have a thick vessel wall around it, that's classic for a stromal nodule or BPH. Normally, in any other tumor or any normal structure, with these thin little tiny capillaries, you wouldn't see this thick wall. The thick wall is disproportionate to the size of the capillary, and that's classic for stromal BPH nodule. The stroma itself can be extremely cellular. There's no atypia, there's no mitotic figures. Um, now, in a resection specimen, you would be able to appreciate it, that it's multinodular, which also would be the clue that it's stromal BPH. On a needle, you don't have that, so what you have to rely on is identifying those vessels. Immunostains aren't helpful. Stromal tumors and normal stroma stain the same. ER, PR, CD34 positive. Would schwannoma come in the differential in this case? Yes, yeah, so schwannoma would be something that uh, would be potential. So the, the biggest difference is schwannomas. Every schwannoma I've seen on a prostate needle biopsy has been extra prostatic. I don't think I've ever seen a schwannoma in the prostate. You can still see it on a needle biopsy, but sometimes they go through, a, let's say, a needle biopsy nodule, where they think a nodule rectal exam is actually a schwannoma outside the prostate. So it definitely is something sometimes you have to think about with a cellular spindle cell lesion if you didn't see those thick walled vessels. So I talked about prostate cancer apparently expressing P63. So here, in this nodule, so it kind of comes into focus, We have tumor that basically that looks classic for Gleason score 5 plus 5 equal 10. So prostate cancer, when it's high grade, cells still most of the time look relatively uniform. We have nice prominent nucleoli. This doesn't look like urethelial cancer. This looks like prostate cancer. So, and if I had this probably, you know, as my own case, I wouldn't have done any stains. But this was stained at an outside institution. And you know, they stained it for NKX 3.1. Well, I might have stained it, I can't recall. Uh, but here's the NKX 3.1. You can see beautifully positive. And I, as I've mentioned, this is a very specific stain. So, you know, goes along with morphology. This is prostate cancer, no question about it. I mentioned the other marker, P501S. P501S is, is a, is, I also like it as a prostate marker because it has very distinctive staining. It has very clumpy, uh, gr granular staining in the cytoplasm. Uh, so when you see this clumpy granular staining, 
you can feel more, you know it's real staining. Sometimes with uh, immunocytoplasmic staining, you can get some non-specific blush, but with uh, P501S, this clumpy staining, again, tells you it's real. So no question it's prostate cancer, and KNAX is positive, P501S, morphology is positive. But here's GATA3. Shouldn't stain prostate cancer, but you, know, you can see it even at low power. Um, and I did this, you know, with several, several stains just to make sure there was no, you know, no mix-up in the antibody. Um, but this is, you know, a, 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 a prostate cancer that's apparently expressing GATA3. So it's uncommon, um, but it does happen. And it's just something to be aware about, uh, be aware, aware of that GATA3 sometimes, most of the time it's focal, but occasionally like this, you can see diffuse GATA3 in prostate cancer. Okay, so this is a case, and I'll talk about this tomorrow as well, but we'll only go through it. So this is somebody who had hematuria, there was a small mucosal irregularity um, on his bladder. And what we see, the first thing that catches your attention, if you only look at the epithelium, is you would say this looks like invasive erythelial cancer. You'd say there's nest down in the stroma, there's atypia there, there's atypia there, the pattern looks like invasive erythelial cancer, no problem. But with bladder, as I'll emphasize tomorrow, this is just a prelude, it's critical to look at the background stroma, look at the whole lesion, don't just focus on the epithelium. When you look at this, what's intervening between those nests, we see a lot of hemosiderin, we see a lot of red blood, and we see this pink acellular material, which is fibrin. When we have invasive urethral cancer, that's not the background that we see with invasive urethral cancer. Invasive urethral cancer, most of the time you have no stromal reaction. At most, maybe a little sometimes cellular stromal reaction, but never hemosiderin, never fibrin, uh, and never hemorrhage. So when you see these irregular nests, that look like invasive cancer in the lamp appropriate with the background that I just described, that's not cancer. It's pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia. Uh, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. It's associated with ischemia of the bladder, but I'll go into great depth on uh, kind of the whole entity tomorrow. For now, I'll just cover, you know, we'll kind of look at the morphology. But the problem is, out of context, if I just looked at any one of these nests, out of context, it would look like cancer. So again, in bladder, the stress is, Look at the whole lesion, um, nothing out of context. So you base, this is a lesion that we can see, a kidney lesion. We've now gone over it this morning, so you guys are all professional uh, renal pathologists or neoplastic renal pathologists. So, what do we see? We see solid, we see cystic, and we see... So, yeah, it should be an ESC, using a like solid and cystic. So, the next thing we do is we go down and we look for those little purple stippled calcifications in the cytoplasm, and there's a bunch of them all over the place, these little purple little granules, and I just randomly went on some field, and they're there. So that's what this is, ESC. Uh, and if you look at the cystic area, very nicely, these little hobnail cells. So hobnail is actually your true nail. If you look up in the dictionary, it's a nail that the head of the nail, instead of flat, is kind of like bumped up round. And that's why we get the, these cells that have these rounded protuberances on them. Um, but ESC is a low-grade carcinoma. It does metastasize, but uncommonly. As I mentioned before, associated with TSC mutations and mTOR mutations. And most of the time it's sporadic, but it occasionally can be seen with tuber sclerosis. Um, so it's important to make the diagnosis. And then the only other stain you want to do is, again, there's really one stain, and that's a CK20. And that's the only time pretty much you'll hear anybody should be talking about CK20 in immunopathology. CK20 can be focal. In this case, it's actually you know, quite, quite uh, diffusely spread out, or more than just a rare cell here and there. And that's definitive for this diagnosis. So, Everybody has CK20 as a stain, it's not a fancy stain. So this is a diagnosis you know, in renal pathology you, you can make. We don't hold like it. This is just a really weird case, but it was a fun case, so uh, I thought I would show it. 
It's a prostate needle in a nine-year-old. So who's getting a prostate biopsy with a nine-year-old? This was for somebody who had a big mass in their prostate, a boy. And what we can see are these little nodules uh, that are little spindle cell nodules and mixoid there, another one there. Even if you look at, let's say over here, it starts as another little nodule, another one. So this is somebody with neurofibromatosis. And these are plexiform neurofibromas in the prostate. Um, the only case I've ever seen. Um, but they were ruling out, they wanted to rule out a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor in this individual. And you know, S100 positive as you would expect. So this is a case that's somewhat similar to what I showed, but a little different, uh, that emphasizes when you're looking at prostate needle biopsies, you have to take into account everything, not just the architecture. Because if you were to look at the architecture of this case, you would say this should be prostate cancer. It doesn't look like any normal prostate tissue. You know, the glands are crazy crowded, it's going all the way down this core. You know, this should be prostate cancer. But that's, you know, okay, at low power, that's maybe your impression, but let's look at it at higher magnification. So we look at higher magnification, in general, pretty bland, these little glands here. Not a lot of cytologic atypia. So you keep going down in some more of these glands, and you keep on looking for some cytologic atypia, but it ends up being that there isn't any. Keep going down here. Again, virtually no cytologic atypia. And then as you get down towards the bottom, you start seeing some of these glands start having maybe a little bit multi-layering to them which is something you see more with basal cell hyperplasia. And finally, at the bottom, some of these glands start having some cribriform glands as well. Let me go to the bottom. Here we start seeing cribriform glands. You say, okay, that should be cribriform having four cancer. But again, you look at it, there's just no cytologic activity. Now, this still potentially could be cancer. Some prostate cancers, you don't see cytologic atypia. But with all this cancer up and down this core, cribriform, small glands, the fact that we're not seeing any cytologic atypia is unusual. And you should ask yourself, despite being so florid, could this be a benign mimicry? Could this be florid adenosis and, and cribriform hyperplasia coexisting? And sometimes, these various mimickers, adenosis, basal cell hyperplasia, cribriform hyperplasia, can all coexist in the same uh, area of the prostate. So in a case like this, you, again, don't want to use your gestalt, oh, this looks like cancer. You have to say, okay, these are all the features that Dr. Upside talked about favor cancer. And you know, there's just not many features favoring cancer in this biopsy, despite the architecture looking so abnormal. In that case, you have to say, okay, let's step back, let's do a basal cell marker and you know, see if it stains like cancer or if it doesn't. And you can see even at low power, there's too much brown here. So all of these glands contain a basal cell layer. These are all adenosis, florid adenosis of the prostate, not cancer. And you know, there may be one or two glands in here that are, are patchy, but are negative, but that's fine for adenosis. If you go down to the cribriform glands, at the bottom, you know, they also have basal cell layers. Now you could argue maybe that's introductal cancer or AIP, but there's no cytologic atypia, so that's inconsistent with AIP. So this is cribriform hyperplasia. Um, so this is a case of just extensive florid adenosis uh, and some cribriform hyperplasia on the needle, where the, the low power looks like cancer, but then when you go to higher power and try to find other features for cancer, they're not there, and you have to yourself have to ask have, you have to ask yourself, could this be a florid benign mimicry? <coughs> this is a renal mass, and it has two components. So this one component. So my wife asked me to uh, made a point that I might be. Incorrect. So does everyone know what Swiss cheese is? Maybe people don't have Swiss cheese in Kuwait. Do you know Swiss cheese with the holes in it? Okay, fine. <laughs> well, I had to ask. So, okay, so this is kind of a Swiss cheese area with these, with these open holes. And if we were to go down and look at them, just like the case I showed you, 
You know, they're, they're not normal. These, they're, they have prominent nuclei, they're irregular. So this area of the tumor is tubular cystic carcinoma. Again, think of tubules that are cystic, just the name. But tubular cystic carcinoma by itself should look just like this. Shouldn't have solid areas, shouldn't have more complex areas. Then we come to this area. This is too complex for tubular cystic. So this is tubular cystic carcinoma with poorly differentiated foci, what I talked about earlier. And when we look at this area of poorly differentiated foci, what do we see? These giant red nucleoli, these, these CMV-like, you know, owl-like nucleoli. That when we think of that, we think FH deficient renal cell carcinoma. And as I mentioned, some tubular cystic carcinomas, about, uh, well, a large percentage of, about half of them, tubular cystic carcinomas with poorly differentiated foci lose fumarate hydrogenase. And in fact, in this case, when we did the FH stain, um, you can see beautiful loss uh, in these areas with the big prominent nucleoli uh, of the fumarate hydrogen. So this is an FH deficient RCC arising in association with the tubular sister carcinoma. And we would basically say in our note, this could be associated with hereditary lyomyomatosis associated RCC, HLRCC, but it could also be sporadic. And then it's up to the clinician to do genetic testing, see if the patient has, if it's a female, lyomyomas, um, uh, and, to, to, and assess the patient for potentially germline mutations. So this is a kind of a, a tricky case. It's a late came as a prostate needle biopsy. So one thing you have to be careful about is that if you get something that's prostate needle and you look at it and it looks all kind of mesenchymal, it doesn't look like any obvious prostate cancer, and you don't see any benign prostate tissue, first of all, think you always have to ask yourself, do I see prostate tissue? Because the pitfall is. We all have tunnel vision. If something's labeled prostate biopsy, we think, okay, what in the prostate could this be? We're not thinking maybe it's not even in the prostate. Maybe it's a, a periprostatic lesion. Um, so the first thing when you see something that you know, doesn't look like any normal prostate tissue, it looks kind of mesenchymal, and then you step back and you say, I don't see any prostate lesion, you have to say, again, could this be a soft tissue tumor arising outside the prostate, either pressing the prostate or, or or adjacent to the prostate. And what we see here are these sl small little spindle cell nodules uh, in a mixoid matrix. And some of these spindle cell nodules start uh, you know, spinning out into these little fascicles, almost a little palisading. Uh, and this is a gist, a gastrointestinal scroll. And you think, why is it gist on a prostate needle biopsy? We did a study of this a while ago. And the, the way they manifest, you can get a large gist, either rising from the, from the rectum, muscle wall, or even the mesorectum between the prostate and the, and, the, and the rectum. And that gist can be so large that it actually compresses the prostate almost like a pancake. So to the, and on imaging, they will think it's a prostate tumor nodule, uh, as opposed to a periprostatic nodule. I've also had some cases where the urologist on the rectal exam felt a nodule, and he wanted to biopsy the prostate, and he kind of kept on trying to push the nodule away just so he could biopsy the prostate, and then went through the nodule, and it was a gist. Um, so you have to think of gist, because it's just not in your differential diagnosis of a prostate lesion. But once we recognize that this might not even be a prostate lesion, and we see the morphology, these little spindle cells, um, you at least think of gist. And then once you think of it, you know, you can readily make the diagnosis. You have to be careful to see the, this, CD34 is positive in stromal tumors of the prostate and gist. So if you're thinking it's a stump, for example, stromal tumor runs certain malignant potential and you only do a CD34, you may go down the wrong path. So always think, could it also be a gist and do a C-kit, CD117. It's also reasonable with these spindle cell lesions to do an S100 as well, just to rule out a neural tumor. But, you know, or you could also add a dog one, but this is C-kit, definitely, you know, it, it's a gist. So this is a bladder tumor, another bladder tumor. So at low power, a lot of this tumor is papillary. It's low grade, the nuclei is relatively uniform, not a lot of mitosis, polarity is maintained. 
So I won't go into it that much, but this is a low-grade, non-invasive papillary urethral cancer. So most of it's low-grade, not a problem. But the interesting thing about this tumor is that in the areas of this tumor, let me find the best area. So instead, so with a with many papillary urethral cancers, it's very common to have inverted growth pattern. It's, I would say it's just as common as the exophytic component. But with an inverted growth pattern, the inverted growth has a very rounded, smooth border to it, not irregular, there's no stromal reaction, there's no what we call paradoxical differentiation where the tumor gets pinker when it invades. So right now in the field here, if I were just to look in this field here, this is all low-grade, non-invasive papillary urethral cancer with just an inverted growth pattern. But when we look and come over to here, all of a sudden what we see here is that instead of these nice rounded nests, we're seeing very irregular raggediness. That's invasive cancer. So this is invasive urethral cancer. But the unusual thing about this invasive urethral cancer, it's associated with mucin, this blue-tinged mucinous material. And if you were to stain this up, it's mucicarmin positive, Gaussian blue positive, PS digest positive, it's mucin. And you say, why is there mucin with a urethral cancer? You would expect mucin with an adenocarcinoma, not urethral cancer. And the answer is, you know, we did a study on this, it's unclear why, but bladder has tremendous capability of divergent differentiation. So even though on the morphology, the H and E, we don't see glandular differentiation, this urethral carcinoma is divergently differentiating towards glandular differentiation and can still make mucin even in the absence of overt histological evidence of glandular differentiation. So this is a low-grade mucinous invasive urethral cancer with mucin. It also brings up the point of grading bladder cancer. So 95% of invasive bladder cancers are high-grade. We call it invasive, you know, high-grade bladder urethral cancer, invasive high-grade papillary urethral cancer. But sometimes we see invasive urethral cancer, which morphologically is actually pretty low-grade. So what do you do in that case? In the, there are different schools of thought. Some, urolog some urological pathology experts, for example, when they see a case like this, will call it invasive high-grade cancer, even though morphologically it's low-grade. And the rationale for that is, biologically, it is high-grade. Even though it's not that high-grade cytologically, we're not seeing a lot of mitoses, etc. once it invades, whether it looks low-grade or it looks high-grade, it all has the same prognosis. So some of all again, experts would call this invasive high-grade. I call this invasive low-grade because, because under the microscope it looks low-grade. But it can be confusing to clinicians. And I've seen clinicians, when they get a report of invasive low-grade cancer, they think, oh, maybe it's not so, so something to worry about. It's low-grade, which would be misleading. So when I diagnosed invasive low-grade urethral cancer, I had a note saying that even though morphologically this tumor is low-grade, biologically it has the same prognosis as high-grade stage for stage and should be treated as a high-grade invasive cancer. Do you, do you say in your report it's focal or extensive? Because that might make a difference. Yeah, no, I do say, so, right, so this is, it's a tricky area in, in bladder. So when you have invasive cancer, you should try to give the clinician some indication as to the extent of invasive cancer. There's no uniformly accepted way to do that. Um, sometimes if I can say it's above the muscular mucosa versus below the muscular mucosa, I'll do so. But sometimes you can't make out where the muscular mucosa is. There are sometimes when it's just very focal, I'll say focal invasive cancer. There are sometimes when it's extensive, and I'll say extensive to try to sensitize the clinician to that. There are other techniques that people have come up with by measuring the, how many high power fields, and but none of them I've been, I've been very satisfied with. So I often will do it just subjectively focal or extensive. Now, ultimately, it shouldn't make that much of a difference because. Even if they have muscular propria on the resection, it's recommended they should go back and do a repeat TUR because of the potential of understaging. But I find sometimes you're all just don't do that, and the literature shows they don't do that. So definitely when you have extensive invasive cancer, you want to let them know that to make sure they go back in those cases. So this is a hydrocele sac. So a hydrocele basically is just the mesothelium that's coming down from the perineum that goes down around the testes. Um, and gets filled with fluid off. 
And it often becomes fibrotic and thick and just chronic irritation in the hydrocele sac. And so they take out the, the hydrocele sac and they drain the fluid. Where it becomes an issue for the pathologist is that it's not uncommon in hydrocele sacs to see fluid proliferation of mesothelial tubules. And that's very concerning and can be difficult for pathologists to make the distinction, is this benign reactive mesothelial hyperplasia or potentially malignant mesothelial? Because malignant mesothelial can cause a hydrocele, and so both can present with a hydrocele, either reactive mesothelial proliferation associated with a hydrocele or malignant mesothelial causing a hydrocele. And probably the best way to make the distinction is that in a fluid reactive mesothelial hyperplasia, it's a very linear growth. So all of these tubules here are proliferating just in this linear array in between the kind of more densely collagen and the more inflamed collagen. And that's a classic histology for reactive mesothelial hyperplasia. Now you can go down cytologically and they also can look fairly bland. The problem is some meth malignant mesothelial was can be bland. There are a couple of immunohistochemical stains. If you're not sure, they can be potentially helpful, but maybe not. Uh, MTAP uh, is one, a, a, and BAP1 is another, where it's lost in 50% of malignant mesotheliomas, but the problem is you can, the other 50% of malignant mesotheliomas, it's retained. So if it's lost, it's helpful, it tells you it's malignant. If it's retained, it doesn't help you. Um, but again, in this, I think most of the time, it's the morpho morphology that's helpful, that it's just this linear proliferation uh, of glands in whereas malignant mesothelioma, the tubules tend to go down irregularly into the stroma, they tend to go down into the fat and, and not form this nice kind of just uh, organized linear row of glands. The other thing I find helpful when you have a hydrocele with these is put through more, because often we just put through one or two sections, put through more just to make sure nothing looks worse on additional sections. This is a paratesticular lesion. You can see the testis is normal. So whenever you're looking at a testis or hyectomy or biopsy, you always want to separate out, is it paratesticular or intratesticular? Because often the very different lesions will enter into differential diagnosis. So in this case, we have a paratesticular lesion, so we don't have to think of germ cell tumors. Germ cell tumors only occur in the testis. And when you look at this, it's a very papillary lesion. And when you, when you actually look, look at this at a little higher power, it's actually cilia in all of these little structures. So what is a ciliated, you know, a cytologically typical papillary lesion doing next to the testis? And so when you think of lesions that occur paratesticular, one general category you have to consider is mullerian. Because basically both paratesticular, less commonly intratesticular, you can see the full range of mullerian lesions that you would see in the ovary. You can see serous, mucinous, endometrioid, clear cell. Uh, it can be benign, adenofibromatous, borderline, frankly malignant. Um, this case, I often share them with the GYN uh, pathologist, you know, is considered to be a papillary, uh, serous, borderline tumor. Uh, it has a nice little calcification, so, you know, classic for a, a serous tumor as well. Now, in terms of terminology, I would call this a borderline serous tumor because it's analogous to what we see in the ovary. But whereas in the ovary, when you have a borderline tumor, they call it borderline because they often can spread into the peritoneum and cause a lot of local problems. It turns out in the testis and paratesticular region, when they do an orchiectomy, they cure it. It doesn't go anywhere. These lesions don't spread anywhere. So I say, even though we call it borderline to be analogous to what we see in the ovary, this patient is 100% cured of this lesion, so they're not concerned about that. And they'll stay in, you know, Pax8, they'll stay in just WT1, they'll stay in just like any other uh, GYN tumor. This is a penile lesion, and when you see a penile lesion, so with penile squamous lesions, there are several different types of invasive squamous cancers of the penis. There's usual squamous cancer, which is about 50%. Uh, there's a warty uh, basaloid squamous cancer. There's a warty squamous cancer, a basaloid cancer that we'll talk about. Um, it, there's verrucous carcinoma. Uh, but this is an example of a basaloid warty carcinoma that's non-invasive. 
So what we can see is some of it looks warty. By warty, we mean it kind of has the spiky look like a, like, a, like, a, like a wart. We can also see it has kind of hypergranulosa cell layers, just like, like a wart. But this is very cytologically malignant. So verrucous carcinoma looks totally cytologically benign. Uh, the only way you can recognize verrucous cancer is cancer is because it's pushing down deep. It wouldn't have this degree of atypia. So this is a warty carcinoma. And the basaloid carcinoma component is that it looks very blue. And these are the kinds of cancers that are very HPV associated, uh, basaloid and warty. Usual squamous cancer is only HPV in about 50% of the time. Uh, Verrucous cancer is never, despite its name, is not HPV related. But here when we see this very basaloid proliferation, just like in the anus or the cervix, that's, uh, uh, that's classic for a basaloid kind of squamous carcinoma component. But this is all, you look carefully for invasion, but this is all non-invasive. Is this micro-invasion, that focus that you have just shown on the edge? Yeah, I think there's, there's a little nest that grow down, but not definitively irregular. Some of this is, again, kind of rounded, so not definitively invasive. But, you know, it might, you know, it might be reasonable. I mean, most of this, I think, looks more non-invasive. Yeah, that's focus, yeah. yeah. So the treatment for this lesion is just white White open. excision, yep, white, white excision, open. yep. The last case? Yep, will be the last case. So this is the last case, it's a, te it's a testis lesion. So one of the categories to think of the testis is if it's not germ cell tumor, it's sex cord stromal. So what we see here are these nice tubules. And when you see tubules with nice central nucleoli, that's Sertoli differentiation, just like a normal Sertoli cell. So this is a Sertoli cell tumor. But we also have this cellular kind of fibrous tissue that's basically indistinguishable from a fibrothecoma in the ovary. So this would be a, a Sertoli fibrothecoma, uh, totally benign. And the most important stain that you want to do with these germ, with sex core stromal tumor is SF1. A lot of these are inhibin positive, but inhibin to be negative. Steroid factor one or steroid, steroidogenic factor one is much more sensitive and is the best marker for sex core stromal. We'll stop with that. Thank you very much.